Um, Adam, I, I've, I've got to start with, where did you meet Mary Phillips? Like, <laughs> how did you meet this lady? Yeah, um, well, Mary Phillips is a friend of my aunt's. Okay. And she came to see a screening of a feature film that I made called Tomorrow Never Knows with my aunt. So Tomorrow Never Knows was a film I made as part of my graduate program. So it was a thesis project, essentially. Um, my aunt called and said, hey, do you mind if I bring my friend Mary with with me to see the movie. I was like, bring whoever you want, you know? Um, so she brought, uh, she brought Mary with her and uh, after that, like about a year later, I went back to um, Boulder where I did my grad work and screened a documentary that I edited called Pow Wow. Um, Mary and my aunt showed up again and after that screening, Mary said to me, maybe you want to make a film about my community. And I was like, what's your community, Mary? And she turned to my aunt and said, does he know about me? <laughs> um, and she, she said, well, I'm in the Salt Lake City BDSM community. And I was like, what? Because um, you've seen Mary. Yes. Not the person you imagine you'd find inside of that. I thought scene. it was about bridge or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Something like this. Um, and so she told me that. I was like, no, I don't think so. Initially, I, I turned her down. And then we had a long conversation over dinner, and she told me some incredible stories. And I told her that, actually, I want to make a film about her and that her community would be in the movie, but it would be about her. And that's how that whole project started. So the film you watched is actually a short, um, but it's a scene from this feature film that I'm making with Mary. The whole film is about Mary? Yeah, it's called The Flamingo. Please keep going. <laughs> I'm not gonna stop you. So The Flamingo is, um, yeah, that is her moniker inside of the Salt Lake City. Yeah, we, we see it in the short. Right. Yeah. yeah, you see the you see it on. She like lays out this this little display for you um, in the short. And uh, flamingos are all over her life. Like it's it's everywhere. Um, but she adopted this moniker inside of that community uh, because that's what people do in that world. That they they just find a, another way to refer to themselves. In, amongst themselves, you know, so. Well, they sort of have to. It's it's a yeah. community that is very uh, shunned upon. But I mean, I used to work in in sales for the back page of the Village Voice papers. Okay. Yeah. So we would deal with a lot of doms and their issues of advertising, marketing, getting to know people. It's a difficult community to, especially in Salt Lake. I can't. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Except for I mean, when you start to think about Salt Lake, like. Like Salt Lake, it, I mean, and Mormonism, in a way, is like already kind of a kinky space, right? <laughs> you got people with multiple wives. Like, there's the weird underwear thing going on. Like Salt, like Mormonism. It's the perfect place. It's probably right. it's probably the exact. There's probably way more folks in that community in Salt Lake than you even imagine. I've got to ask you, you have traveled just in our conversations, Seattle, yeah. Boulder. Now you, you just found that out. Yeah. Salt Lake, New Orleans. Yeah. You're in Detroit. Yeah. Is there anyone you haven't been? Texas? I, maybe. <laughs> I've been to Texas. <laughs> yeah. no, <I'm> <laughs> I've been all over, you know, um, but I lived, I lived in, I grew up in New Jersey, moved to Minneapolis, went to undergrad, University of Minnesota. Um, worked here for a while. After I finished undergrad, I did commercial film production for a while with a company called Twist Films. I was here making 30 second, 60 second TV commercials. Um, and then got into the film festival community um, and film exhibition communities here. So I worked for an organization called Minnesota Film Arts, and we produced the Minneapolis St. Paul International Film Festival, um, the Jewish Film Festival, the LGBTQ Film Festival. It was sort of the hub of all film exhibition in the Twin Cities. Um, 
and that organization went through like a really rough patch and I had to figure out what to do with myself and landed a gig out in Seattle at the Northwest Film Forum where I worked for eight years and then went to grad school in Boulder um, and University of Colorado then moved out to New Orleans um, and lived and worked there, ended up teaching there for a while at Loyola University yeah. in New Orleans. Lovely campus, by the way. You've been there? Hilarious. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, it's a nice spot. Yeah. A lot of people film on that campus, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, and then I, I just moved up to Detroit to teach at the University of Michigan. And the Boulder program, I've interviewed a few from Boulder. It's not a bad little program at all. It's great. Yeah, it's an amazing school. The grad program in particular is, like, it's incredible because there's not that many grad students. Um, they take two a year. It's a fully funded program. You get your own studio. You get to teach filmmaking. There are, when I was there, there was nine full-time faculty, and there were six grad students. So that meant you had all the time in the world that you wanted with the faculty, which was pretty incredible. What was your focus while there? What, what were you concentrating on while you are out there? Yeah, so um, it's really a place where I pivoted into documentary work um, and in fact ended up with not just the MFA, but I had a certificate in um, documentary in kind of a separate program that, that started there around the same time that I was going through. Yeah. Creating your own degrees. I love it. That's cool. <laughs> um, I've got to ask, since you were at the, the start, really, of the Minneapolis film scene from the festival circuit, like, what was it that you were trying to capture? Was it a local feel? Were you trying to bring filmmakers in? What yeah. was the, the impetus behind the start of these film festivals here? Well, let me say that I was not the start of them. Well, <laughs> I mean, um, there was a guy who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago named Al Milgram, and he sort of is the godfather of this scene. Um, and he started that in his 40s, and I met him when he was in his 80s. <laughs> so, um, or maybe just turning 80, something like that. You know, it was like he had his impetus initially was he saw the way that filmmakers in Europe were creating um, their work by essentially showing films or doing film curation or working in, uh, you know, cr film criticism or something like that. And he thought that that was his pathway to make films. The funny part about that or the tragic part about that is that he ended up not finishing any of those works for over 40 years. So really his legacy is not the films he made as much as it's this incredible film community here in the Twin Cities um, that he really fostered. He was interested in like bringing the world to this town. Um, he grew up in Minnesota, so he's you know a son of of the state and um, really understood this community in ways that I probably, even though I spent a lot of time here, like I think he understood it better than I I ever could. <laughs> yeah. So maybe not the origins of the film scene, but what about the festival we're at? Can you tell me how did Sound Unseen start and the fact that it started in 99 in Minneapolis? Yeah. Very serendipitous. Yeah, so the so Sound Unseen started out of the University Film Society, which is the organization that Al founded. Um, and it started with an employee um, named Nate Johnson, who was working, I think he was actually like the publicist for the organization at the time but the way that Al kind of allowed for curation to exist inside of that organization was essentially you could come to him with like any idea and as long as you believed in it and can convince him that you you believed in it he'd give you the space to do it so Sound Unseen was born out of out of that organization and for the first um not for the first year, but like year two, three, four, maybe. Uh, Nate took it after he birthed it in, you know, in the safety of that organization, kind of took it out on his own. Um, and that became his baby for a while. 
Uh, he continued to do screenings with the organization, and the organization evolved um, from being just the University Film Society into being the University Film Society and another theater called the Oak Street, um, and then it became Minnesota Film Arts, the larger organization. Um, and so Nate was screening some work at the Oak Street um, and at the Film Society, and then he decided to become a farmer. <laughs> and the um, it uh, kind of folded back in to Minnesota Film Arts at that time. Um, with a woman named Gretchen Williams, who was part of the organization, um, she was she was like throwing incredible parties all over the Twin Cities, um, and we hired her to help um, with parties, but also like doing other kind of administrative things for Minnesota Film Arts. So she brought it back into the fold, um, and then. When she left, again, she took it with her, uh, and she sold it, I think, to Rick Hansen. Um, Rick had it for a few years, and then he sold it to Jim Brunzel, who's been running the festival like for over a decade now. And for th those that don't know, uh, you met Jim at college. Yeah, so Jim and I went to undergrad together here in the, at the University of Minnesota. Um, and really, our friendship started because he, be, he was a volunteer um, at the theater, at the, at the University Film Society Theater, the Bell Auditorium. And um, when I left, I was like, was he, he was talking a lot about wanting to become, like, get into this field. And I was like, here's your chance, man. <laughs> and he, so he got, he took my job pretty much, for better or worse for him at the time. But <laughs> <laughs> as far as, like, if you had to put, uh, to explain the scene of, of Minnesota film scene, how would you explain it to those outside of Minnesota? Um, the content, not, not necessarily the scene, but the, yeah. the movies and stuff coming out of here. That people make here? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I don't know that I could speak to it like in terms of a contemporary moment, but when I was living here, there was, I mean, it's, you know, kind of scrappy independent filmmaking in the most traditional sense of that. I mean, I was here at a time when digital filmmaking was kind of just getting off. We, like, people were shooting on mini DV, you know? Um, and those films uh, were having, they had a hard time getting into the commercial marketplace because that space was still being dominated primarily by film, by 35 millimeter films, 16 millimeter films, that sort of thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there were a lot of people who were ambitious and like trying to, to get their work made. And in fact, I worked on a few films um, as an assistant director during that time. Um, but all of them were being shot. They were all shot on mini DV. Not that there weren't films that were going from mini DV into 35 that like people were blowing up, but they were few and far between. And they were like, it was a very expensive process. Um, so filmmaking has gotten just so much more affordable now than it was then. And I'm sure the scene here is like enormous compared to what it was at the time. Can you share with us the, the Cinema 19 experience and what oh, yeah. you were able to Man, be involved in with research. that? You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so Cinema 19 was a project that um, my friend Usama al Shaibi and I started um, during the pandemic. So at the beginning of the pandemic, Usama went to grad school with me at University of Colorado. And when you say beginning, this is the first few months. Yeah, I mean like very early days. You know, you're calling, you're checking in on your friends, seeing how they're doing. And Usama's like, I, I kind of have this thought about doing something around this. And he and I started spitballing ideas. And initially he was like, let's commission 19 second films. And I was like, that is too short. <laughs> like, especially for this moment, that just felt wrong. Um, as everybody's like stuck in their house. Um, but he wanted it to kind of, to put a time limit on it, not even a limit, but sort of like some parameters around that. Almost snapshots. Yeah, so the film became that. It became like snapshots of 
um, sort of of the experience, but like the peripheral experience of COVID in those early days, not so much like this is what's happening, but sort of like ideas and like the ambience of that moment more than like I'm making a documentary about COVID-19, you know, so um, we commissioned. You can take it out of the context almost because of that, right? I think you can. I mean, it like it does function inside of that context in a really beautiful way, um, but I don't think it's limited to that context. So, yeah, there were, I, you know, I think it was like 12 or 14 filmmakers who ended up participating in Cinema 19. And that that program, like, we toured it around a little even, which was interesting. Um, and we got a lot of press because there weren't a lot of um, projects like that at the time. That's very cool. Uh, as far as like surviving this and that yeah. experience, how has that changed you as a filmmaker? as someone who's entrenched in teaching also the next group of filmmakers. Yeah. Maybe that's more how this has impacted, how you teach film to kids who've survived this, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think how you teach kids who've been through, like, kids are super vulnerable now. They were already, they were like, I was experiencing them as being pretty vulnerable before COVID, but now in particular, they're like, they're, they're, they're very fragile. Um, and I think that that experience of being locked in the home, um, separated from each other, like losing that kind of social contact, um, made them even more, uh, yeah, like just, they, they just have a lot of issues. Um, so it's, it's actually, it's, it's been a pretty challenging moment in terms of dealing with students. Uh, I think that they're, I, I hope anyway, that that's like a temporary blip in, in my teaching. Um, not to say that the kids aren't great, because they are. I love my students and they're super creative, but like their anxieties are, are heightened in a way that even more than they were prior to, to COVID-19. You've taught Southern kids, Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've taught Northern kids, Detroit. Yeah. Any difference? Uh, <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I mean, there's a there's a difference in the program, right? Um, so the program at Loyola is a digital filmmaking program. So the students I have are all f filmmakers, and the program that I teach in in Michigan is a journalism and media production program. And so the the students are not like they're they're at a like more elementary level where I'm reaching them. I'm hoping that will improve over time. And I've been thinking a lot about. Um, yeah, what I would love to see this program look like. Um, but because of its hybrid nature, they're not strictly film kids. Just artists, maybe, potentially. Yeah, but I think they're storytellers is maybe the best way to think about them because a lot of them are coming from a, are interested in journalism. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that that's much more about, like, how do you tell a story? Um, then it is like an art. I mean, it, it, you know, journalism is its own art form, but it's not. I wouldn't like classify it as art. Suddenly, the lighting has changed in here. Maybe, you've you've yeah. shifted the mood. Maybe we should check the f-stop. Yeah. <laughs> I think we covered it, but it's. <laughs> I, the mood has changed. I kind of want to get serious, ask yeah. a romantic question. Yeah. Um, can you describe Detroit, the scene in Detroit? We we were talking earlier, and it's it's exciting place. Yeah, I mean Detroit's an, it is an exciting place. So one of the first things I did upon getting there was I reached out to a few filmmakers who I knew in Michigan. I mean, maybe it's better to not so much focus on Detroit as it is to think about Michigan. Although Michigan's an enormous state. Um, the uh, 
there's a festival called the Luce Superior Film Festival. It takes place um, in the fall. And so when they invited me to screen one of my films and I asked them if I, they were open to me putting together some programs and they said, sure. So I wanted to meet the Michigan film community and the way that I felt I could do that most quickly was, hey, reach out to a few folks in, in Michigan and see who's out there um, and put together this program. So I, I screened a, um, a shorts program in Duluth that was all Michigan films. Um, I think the thing about even the Detroit area is that it's like very dispersed, the community. Um, New Orleans kind of geographically forces you to have this kind of concentration because of the even the, just the design of the city. Yeah. You know, it's like a it's like a it's a crescent they call it Crescent City. It's pretty much a crescent, so everything's got sort of like squeezed together. Whereas Detroit is like this sprawling city, um, and as a result of that, like the filmmakers are not concentrated really. They're sort of everywhere. Um, they, I've met a bunch of people in Ann Arbor and in Ypsilanti and some folks in, in Detroit itself. But the, then there are filmmakers who I got connected with who are like out in Grand Rapids and some people up on the Upper Peninsula. Yeah. Um, so there, there, I love that you're... <laughs> help separating like Detroit based films like I mean there's some big budget films like that White Boy Rick that came through there or yeah, sure. their documentaries like the Sugar Man story that was there but yeah. you're totally right there are some amazing films throughout the natural side of Detroit yeah. outside all the cities I mean Michigan has been covered by documentaries especially there's some really interesting stuff so is, is there a favorite place in <laughs> Michigan you've had uh, I, I've been there just too short a period of time to like really answer that one other thing I'll say though um, is that Michigan at the moment doesn't have a great film incentive program and so I know that there are people working on that there and I think if the if Detroit um, and Michigan got the film incentive back uh, people there have, they've talked to me about like that was a moment when things were really humming and I think that hopefully the state and now that it's a Dem yes, the Democrat-controlled state. Maybe it's the perfect time to like return the um, the incentive to Michigan and and sort of rebuild the the filmmaking scene there. It's almost. I mean, it's a, it's a game changer for so many different areas. If you can bring film to that, or you can help cultivate your film scene. I mean, the incentive program is massive. We have it in Texas, and it, yeah. we get dwarfed by Louisiana and right. Arizona. I mean, we're getting destroyed. It's totally understandable. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, that was that in New Orleans. Um, New Orleans is like it's amazing. It's crazy how many films are in production there at any given time. Like at the peak when I was there, there were like over twenty films and TV shows and we're talking like big budget projects going on in town um, so and that only happened after they returned the film incentive program because people there when I got there were like yeah we lost all this work to Atlanta because everything went out there we, they they had a better film incentive um, so and I think that that actually you know if we bring it back to like the education thing I think that really helped my students um, yet again <laughs> big big change in, in lighting here apologies to the home viewer <laughs> I think it'll pick it up you're good okay I, you know Adam I'd, I'd love to to kind of close things out by allowing you to tell us how can we find more info about you sure when the hell are you going to finish this the flamingo doc? yeah oh my god I want to know what's going on and <laughs> yeah do you talk to your aunt differently now after no, no, this no. process? So my, I'll, 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 let's is say there a separation. My, my, my aunt, you know, my aunt is just a friend of Mary. She's not in the scene. Um, she kindly participated in the film uh, to be another body at a dungeon party that Mary threw. My aunt's like cool and open to things, and is like she's pretty amazing. Um, 
and you know Mary's not like totally out to everybody yet but she will be once the film's done um, and uh, Look, can we get back to this dungeon scene where yeah. did you is this in New Orleans no this was in this was in Salt Lake so when I first started this project um, Mary I, when she agreed to when when she got me really to agree to do it let's say uh i was like when should i come and she said oh there's this amazing terrible question to ask a dominatrix said. what's that <laughs> oh the dungeon question no no uh, no when when should i come was I, oh i see yeah well double entendre right um <laughs> so uh she, she told me that i should 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 show up and start filming around something called Rocky Mountain Rebellion, which is like a BDSM conference that happens in Salt Lake. And uh, so we tried to get into the conference, but for all the obvious reasons, they were like, you are, there's no way in hell you're bringing a camera into that space. And Mary was like, don't worry, I'll just throw uh, an after party at my brother's dungeon. <laughs> And I was like, excuse me? And she's like, oh, yeah, my brother, he, his, um, he, he's in the uh, Salt Lake City queer BDSM community. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. So, uh, so yeah, she got her brother to agree to let us use his dungeon in the basement of his home. Um, and she invited all these people who were at Rocky Mountain Rebellion to come all of them fully aware that the reason they were there was for the the film so they knew that they were coming in to be filmed which meant consent was super easy to get and i will say this about the bdsm community there we all have a lot to learn from them around consent because that is the most consensual space i've ever been in in my life um seeing the ways that these folks um you know, maneuver through kind of difficult <laughs> situations um, with each other that are that are all around touch and uh, even you know obviously like acknowledging kind of the ways in which they are touching each other and and figuring out how to get through that in a way that everybody feels safe um, and comfortable and that they've given full consent to what's happening and that they have the ability to say no um, and stop anything at any moment you know so like if there's a takeaway for me from <laughs> from the experience it's really like wow this is what consent can look like and um, we all have a lot to learn from them that's an awesome set yeah that's so cool yeah oh um where can we find more info where yeah so find? my in terms of my films i have a website um adam com. s-e-k-u-l-e-r s-e-k-u-l-e-r um and on there you can find information about all my work um and you can find some links to some public <laughs> um some public uh videos um there are a few interesting links on there that uh, we didn't even talk about yet but might be interesting to you which is when i was in seattle i started a program that was a one-shot film program um, we had a lot of filmmakers who came through northwest film forum to screen their work and i would ask them if they wanted to teach a workshop so it was like they would teach two-day workshops but many of those filmmakers i also asked if they would be interested in shooting a short film while they were there and the, the 36 hour no is that separate oh wow 36 hours is like a that's a feature film of mine yeah. no this is like something completely different that was housed inside of northwest film forum and the whole concept was you have a single shot right so what film can you make with no edits? Um, and the people who made films in that program are incredible, world-class filmmakers, some of whom are now household names, but they weren't necessarily at the time, including Barry Jenkins, um, Josh and Benny Softy, um, uh, Aaron Katz, Joe Swamberg, uh, Todd Rohall, 
Jamie Siegel, Valerie Mercedian. Uh, there's just a ton of ton of filmmakers who ended up coming through and doing that. So essentially, I produced those films, um, which is really fun to talk to my students about. Where you're like, yeah, I produced a Barry Jenkins short. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not the one that you know. <laughs> But still, to ask them to do that specific showcase, because showing runners and how you even do a single shot, it may be a runner, it may be yes. a solitary shot. I mean, how you con conceptualize that is got to be on another breed of filmmaking. Oh, yeah, it's a totally different... That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It would, and they turned out really well. Like, Barry's film is brilliant. Um, the Softy Brothers film, like, played around at different festivals. Uh, the Valerie Mercedes film premiered in, at the Locarno Film Festival. I mean, it was like, the, these were world-class projects. Um, and I f was super honored and uh, to even be a part of them, you know? Like, just, and I got to know those filmmakers. I felt like at the time that that was my grad school um, and it probably was it was like a good thing to do before going back and like really beginning to refocus on my own filmmaking um, the other thing and I told you about the, I'd tell you the story um, which is sometimes the older filmmakers would show up and we would ask them not to make a short film but to do a PSA uh, about like turning your cell phone off in the theater and so one of the people who came was Melvin Van Peebles <laughs> and actually the theater here um, the Trilon that's part of the sound they unseen play, they play, they play it they play it before every movie um, they play the one that I made in Seattle before every movie here um, but the great story with Melvin <laughs> maybe I shouldn't tell this on <laughs> on camera <laughs> Melvin would want it he was the filmmaker to be that bold yeah well um, hopefully Mario won't <laughs> yell at us but that's on you <laughs> so Melvin came and I was touring it you know showing him around town I went to drop him off at his hotel and he was like what are you doing what, what time frame is this this was you just lost yeah i mean this was like maybe 2012 okay, okay yeah um he had made a new film and we played it and he came and um <coughs> so i went to drop him off at his hotel and he was like what what are you doing and i was like um gonna go back to my house he's like no man you're you're gonna leave the car and you're gonna come up to my room and I was like okay so dropped the car off came up to his hotel room he's like I need to borrow your phone and I was like what and he's like yeah man I need to borrow your phone it's like okay give him my phone he calls somebody up and he's like honey it's Melvin don't you leave the city. I'll be back tomorrow. You better stay in the city, honey. I'll see you tomorrow. He hangs up the phone. He gives it back to me and proceeds to say the filthiest thing in the world that, like, only you would ever accept from Melvin Van Peebles. And he's like, a rat's got to have a lot of holes. <laughs> <laughs> which was crazy what a quote that's I know amazing. I know wow yeah because he was how old would he have been at this point I mean that guy was probably in his late 70s yeah right so. oh that's amazing yeah I know is there anything else I'm missing? Because I feel like... Yeah, I'm already, like, sp Ooh. spilling out more and more. Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think that's the way to end it, It's Adam. a great thing. A rat's got to have a lot of holes. <laughs> and plug your website as the follow-up to that. Yeah, adamsecooler.com. Thank you.